talk today about a range of issues in multi-arm trials. Most of the time I'll be talking about multi-arm, multi-stage trials, which have uh, interim analyses, as we've, we've seen from Cyrus's talk, interim analyses are a nice way of providing efficiency and ethics uh, again on average. So I'm going to give a talk of uh, three parts mostly. First part's quite a short part about multi-arm trials in general. Um, so uh, just, just talk about multi-arm trials without interim analyses. Then I'll talk about, uh, a part of that it will be a talk about multiple testing in multi-arm trials and whether we should do it or not. Then the bulk of the talk will be on multi-arm, multi-stage trials. And I'll aim to give a kind of three different ways in which I've worked on in the past on how you can do uh, these MAMS designs. And it involves different things you do at the interim analysis. And finally, uh, a fairly short part, uh, I'll talk about future directions I'm working on at the moment, which are multi-arm trials with uh, multiple biomarkers. So hopefully that might be of interest. And yeah, I think an hour and a half is the most I've ever had to fill before. Uh, almost turned down the, the invitation just because I couldn't uh, see how I possibly fill so much time. So the talk should be about 45 minutes to 50 minutes. So I'm really hoping you'll have some uh, good discussion and questions along the way. And I have put some slides kind of equally spaced throughout with some discussion points. So hopefully it won't have to all wait till the end. Okay, so let's start about multi-arm trials. Uh, what are they? Why do we want to do them? So multi-arm trials are when you've got several new experimental treatments that you'd like to test at once. So you have to have several new treatments in the same disease indication. And uh, in that case, you'd normally do separate uh, traditional randomized controlled trials for each one separately, comparing to a control group. But an alternative is one where you have several novel treatments in the same trial uh, with a shared control group. So yes, this might be uh, randomized, oh, sorry, it might be randomizing patients between a control treatment and three, say, distinct treatments, treatment A, treatment B, treatment C. As Cyrus said earlier, it might be randomizing between control and three doses of a, of a new treatment. It could be combinations of treatments, so randomizing between control and you've still got the A, B, and C, but you've got the combinations, you've got pairs of them there. It could be like, like a lot of different options. You could have these things mixed together. You could have doses, combinations, distinct treatments, things like that. So what's the reason to do this instead of just doing separate trials like we've been doing for quite a while? Well, the main reason is the efficiency gain we can have from this shared control group. This shared control group means you need fewer patients to be allocated to the control arm compared to um, trial, separate trials. That means you can test a greater number of patients with, sorry, greater number of treatments with the same number of patients, which is important in today's world where we're often limited in the terms of the number of patients that can be recruited. There's other reasons, so there's logistical reasons and practical reasons. You only have to submit one application to do a trial. Um, you only have to do one protocol, things like that. There's also evidence um, that multi-arm trials are more popular with patients because I don't think many patients go on a, a randomized control trial to get the control treatment. So the greater the chance they have of getting a new treatment, the more likely they might be agreed to go on a trial like this. And there's actually empirical evidence on that now. So a paper in The Lancet by Max Palmer et al. talking about a few different multi-arm trials they've done in their clinical trials unit and how they've had really impressive recruitment and they attribute it to this multi-arm design. Okay, so... Um, what do we actually gain? So I've said there's an efficiency gain, but what is the efficiency gain? So I'm going to try and go between the two screens because it's a bit, <laughs> a bit strange. Um, so uh, let's say we've got a toy example where we've got a new treatment and we want to test it in a phase two trial against the control treatment. And that would require recruiting 50 patients to the experimental treatment and 50 patients to the control treatment. Now let's say we've got more than one treatment, so we might have up to five treatments, for example. Every new treatment we want to do would take another 100 patients to do this phase two trial if we're doing it in a separate manner. If, on the other hand, we put all of the experimental treatments into the same trial and just have the one control group, so let's say we still only need the 50 patients on control and 50 patients per experimental arm, that means as we increase the number of treatments, we're only increasing it by 50 each time. So you see, by the time we get down to five treatments here, um, we're saving quite a lot compared to doing separate trials. And this is without any kind of interim analysis. This is just uh, doing the trial and analyzing it at the end. Now, this last column I'm going to come back to after the next slide. So this is about multiple testing. 
So multiple testing comes from the fact that we've got these several new treatments that we're comparing against control. If we're just doing a single trial with a single primary outcome, we'd only have a single null hypothesis. So if delta represents the treatment effect, then the null hypothesis would be that delta is less than or equal to zero, perhaps. That might re represent the difference in treatment means if you're looking at a normally distributed outcome or perhaps a log odds ratio or a log hazard ratio if you're doing binary or time to event um, endpoints. But in a multi-arm trial, we've got multiple new treatments that have been compared to control. So for each, let's say we've got capital K experimental treatments. For each one of them, we're comparing it to control and we have a treatment effect for each one. And so we've got capital K null hypotheses to be tested. And each one of these is, in a sense, equally important. They're, they're all primary null hypotheses. So, um, so we, what we could do, and some people recommend this, is just say, well, if we were doing the trial separately, we wouldn't need to adjust for the fact that we're testing several um, treatments. Uh, we, we just use the same significance level, say 5% for each trial, and don't adjust for this multiple testing. Some people, on the other hand, think that you should really strongly control for this, so you should have a 5% chance of making a type 1 error in the multi-arm trial. And in that case, as Cyrus was saying uh, earlier, this is called the family-wise error rate, and that's the, the total chance of making a type 1 error. So some people recommend you should control that at the same level that you would have controlled the type 1 error rate in a separate trial. Now, what happens if we do this? So this is where the third column here comes into play. This comes from something called the Dunnett correction, which takes into account the fact that there's correlation between the different test statistics. So this is amongst the most efficient corrections you can make. You can see if we do go the full way and correct, uh, so we get a 5% family-wise error rate, we lose a lot of the efficiency gain we got from the multi-arm trial, but we're still getting quite a, quite a lot. So if we have five treatments, for example, 420 patients instead of 500, so that's still a, quite a good gain. Do we need to correct for um, multiple testing? Well, as I said, there's kind of competing points of view on this. Some people think no, because you wouldn't have to in separate trials. Some people think you should, because if you're doing an experiment, you should control the chance of making a type 1 error in your experiment. So this paper here is one that I worked on with some colleagues, where we looked at different viewpoints in the literature about this problem and tried to summarize them. And well, we wanted to come to a consensus, but it was difficult to do that. We kind of the consensus we came to was that this multiple testing might be more necessary if you're doing a confirmatory trial. It's kind of implied in guidance by the FDA that you should correct for multiple testing, but it's not explicitly said for multi arm trials of distinct treatments. Um, but it's probably more necessary for trials confirmatory, and it's also more necessary if you're comparing several new doses or regimens of the same treatment to a control. That's because if you're not correcting, then you know, whatever null hypothesis you reject, you are recommending the same treatment in practice. Well, question. If, if you were doing <coughs> five separate trials, yeah. uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're looking at five separate versus one, but would, you wouldn't have this, would you have just one, one control arm then for all, all the five separate trials, or would, would you have the... Yeah, imagine you've got the same control arm in each case. You'd have a, a same, so you'd have, here you have only uh, 100 patients, 100, uh, you know, on the control arm. Yeah. And, and, and 100, 100, 100 for the other treatment well, arm. Well, 50. Whereas in the other case, you'd have 500 patients total on the control arm, because you'd have a- Yes, you'd have a lot more, you'd have a lot more control right? patients, yeah. Yes. Are you saying that affects whether you should test for- well, I mean, you're going to, uh, I, I mean, you know, if you're arguing that uh, you yep. should, uh, it, it's okay not to adjust. Yeah. It, it, it's okay not to adjust. People don't adjust when they, uh, across, people don't normally adjust across trials, right? Uh, exactly, yeah. So that's uh, one of the arguments that but you wouldn't do. But you pay for that by, by just having a bigger sample size overall, right? Well, no, people argue if you're doing this multi-arm trial where you've got a reduced number of controls even compared. There, even there, yeah, they argue that. Well, we don't need to correct in that case because if we were doing them separately, but then we would be doing it that way separately, right? Well, I kind of I, I sympathise with your point of view. That's what I think, but a lot of people who are doing these trials don't agree with that and think that you sh shouldn't adjust if you're d doing several. But that kind of leads me on to my first uh, discussion slide about you know what what you guys think about whether we should adjust for 
multiple testing or not. So yeah. you, you probably agree with me that you probably should, <laughs> <laughs> at least in a confirmatory yeah, setting. I think in an exploratory setting, it's probably not necessary and it's probably a bit damaging as well because it's yeah. good to have a higher type one error rate in that case. Um, so, you know, should we adjust? Uh, number two, so I've talked about multi-arm trials where you're comparing experimental treatments to a shared control group, but should that, is that what we should be doing or should we be comparing the different experimental arms as well? And I think the main reason that's not done in practice is because pharmaceutical companies don't want their treatments to be compared to another pharmaceutical company's treatment. But maybe we should be doing this and should be powering trials for that. And I suppose another one is, you know, most of the methodology assumes as if you're doing distinct treatments, even if you're not, and you're doing doses or combinations of treatments. So should we be using different designs um, if we're doing these different things? And can we get more information in that case? So I'm not going to move on until someone says something, other for me. This is probably more of a dumb question, but isn't there in this setting more correlation between the active arms and placebo? Because if you have a placebo that's just randomly low, if what, that's a situation where all of the treatments, therefore, by chance, could show an effect. So there, there must be something subtly different than running Yeah, I think you're right that uh, if, if a control arm is doing randomly worse than it should, then it's more likely that you'll recommend multiple experimental treatments. So, I mean, if you're looking at the family-wise error rate, that doesn't matter too much because you're looking at the case where all, well, I'll show you later, but you're looking at the case where all of the treatments have the same effect as control in order to control that. But I think if you're, even if you don't agree with adjusting for the family-wise error rate, perhaps uh, you, you know, people should acknowledge that there's more chance that uh, you'll get multiple false positives at once because of the shared control group, yeah. Uh, I want to comment on discussion point three, mm -hmm. and I think that should be considered, especially if you think about different doses. And there's also the MCP mod approach, yes. so where you really use the underlying, well, you assume some dose shape, dose efficacy shape, and you apply the multiple comparison only later on after you exploited this additional information. And yep. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. So if, you, if you're if you willing to assume dose response shapes, or in fact in MCP mod they allow for different dose response shapes, then you'd probably want to do that because it was going to increase your efficiency in this multi-arm trial. One of the examples I'll talk about later, I don't really strongly introduce it, but it's called the Taylor trial, and that was different doses, but they didn't want to make any assumptions about the, uh, the kind of relative effect of different doses. They didn't want to assume any shape at all, so they treated it as, this, as if they were distinct treatments with very possible d different treatment effects, if that makes sense. So what about for uh, different endpoints? That, that um, prob probably would not fit in this model, right? Uh, multiple endpoints and multiple... multiple, multiple uh, end. uh, it's something we've considered, certainly, yes. Uh, we haven't really come across any practical example where it's been needed. But I think it, you know, there are, there's methodology for looking at multiple treatments when there's toxicity and efficacy, for example. So uh, I think it's something people have considered, but it's not generally very widely used. So, um, if you have a design where you, you, you can win, on, if, if, as long as you win on at least one, at least one yes. of several endpoints. Yeah. Uh, That's, you, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know the correlation, I suppose, between the... Uh, yes, exactly, you don't know that, but maybe you can estimate it during the trial and uh, use it in some way. Um, actually, the multiple endpoint thing is an analogy I use for why maybe you should adjust for multiple testing, because if you're doing multiple uh, different endpoints in the same trial, then I think it's quite widely accepted that you should adjust for that, if, if any of them being significant means you recommend the treatment. But of course, you could do separate trials for the same treatment where each one of the endpoints is tested in a separate trial. And you know, by the argument of uh, by the argument, you wouldn't have to adjust for that. So why would you have to adjust? But that's one of the, yeah. Uh, hold, uh, Pete had a question. Sorry. So I'm, I, I, I'd like to be a little provocative and say that we're focusing on the wrong thing. Okay. Because what we're not talking about are what are the decisions to be made resulting from this piece of work. Yes. And if we're looking at 
combining data from three or four different studies to make a decision about which is the best treatment to recommend, yeah. then I suggest we take a different approach to looking to see can we recommend three of them, four of them, five mm -hmm. of them, which is a different question. Yes. And in that case, that, that dictates to my mind what sort of error rate we want to control and how we want to handle it all. Absolutely. I, I perfectly agree that if, you, uh, if your trial, once it's finished, a recommended treatment is going to go straight into the clinic and be used in practice, then that's a very different situation to an early stage trial where you're looking for one or two to take forward to a phase three trial or something like that. So I think that's why we distinguish between the exploratory and confirmatory setting. But it, yeah, I've, there's a lot more to consider there. So yeah, yeah. Just back to the situation, we might have multiple endpoints and multiple um, comparisons. You yeah. could do hierarchical testing of the endpoints and then absolutely. within each of those hierarchical testing across the um, doses or whatever the drugs yeah, are. Yeah, absolutely. If that makes so sense. If you, if you have different doses, that's quite often done, isn't it, where you start mm -hmm. testing the highest dose. And if it's significant, you can test the next one down without adjusting and keep going until you get to the one that's not rejected. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very good. Um, that, thank you. That's a great discussion. I'll, I'll move on now just to keep to time, but uh, please come back to me later if, if there's anything um, that comes up. So I've, I've got more discussion along the way. So um, the next um, part of the talk is talking about multi-arm, multi-stage trials where you introduce interim analyses. Um, so we've seen how interim analyses can be useful, but interim analyses can be very different, so you can do different things with them. So they're especially useful, I think, for multi-arm trials, because you can make modifications to which treatments you're considering in the trial in different ways, depending on the results of the trial. So you could be dropping ineffective treatments and just focusing on the ones that are doing well. You could change allocation to different arms, depending on the results so far. Or you could even add in new arms. I'm not going to talk about that subject much, but it's a, quite an important topic in um, in practice at the moment because people are quite keen on trials where you can add in new treatments. You could also allow early stopping for efficacy if you find an effective treatment. Um, so you might want to stop the trial early in that case or you might want to continue just um, testing the treatments that you haven't reached a decision about. Perhaps stopping for efficacy is a bit more controversial in, in trials. I think perhaps stopping for futility I find is less controversial. But I'm quite in favor of uh, allowing early stopping for efficacy. So interim analyses uh, basically provide additional efficiency when you look on average. If you do the trial many times, you should be more efficient than if you don't have an interim analysis. And it also makes the trial more ethical because you could be dropping treatments that aren't performing well, um, or you could be you know, uh, changing the allocation so worse treatments aren't getting so many patients in the future. So I'm going to talk about three different multi-arm, multi-stage trials, which I've kind of worked on the methodology for. And these are group sequential multi-arm, multi-stage designs, which are fairly you know, straightforward extensions of group sequential designs for a randomized controlled trial. I'll talk about multi-stage drop the losers designs. And this is when you, at interim analyses, you select, the one, you select a fixed number of treatments that are doing well to continue and drop the others. And I'll talk about adaptive randomization where you change the allocation in a more continuous manner, depending on the results. So first, group sequential designs. So hopefully you've come across group sequential designs before, but this basically has an interim analysis or more than one interim analysis. And at each interim analysis, you compare each experimental treatment for control using all patients that you've assessed so far. You specify at the beginning of a trial futility and efficacy stopping boundaries. And at each stage, you look at all of the patients recruited so far and calculate a test statistic for each treatment, comparing it to control. For each of these test statistics, if it's below the futility boundary, then you stop that treatment for futility. If it's above the efficacy boundary, you stop the trial and conclude that that treatment's effective so it can be taken forward. Or you could just continue with the other treatments, depending on what you want to do. Um, and if you don't want to allow early stopping for efficacy, you could just set the efficacy boundaries to a case where they're not ever going to be uh, breached. So just as a, a quick example, uh, let's say this is a made up example again, I'm afraid, uh, a three stage trial. So we've got three different analyses. This is the final analysis. And we've got four different treatments. So let's say we've recruited a, a number of patients, maybe a third of the planned total and allocated them equally between control and these four treatments. I'm not sure if you can see that uh, uh, light blue treatment there. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so 
At the first interim, you calculate the test statistics compared to control. And this little uh, light blue treatment here is below the futility boundary. So that one is dropped for futility. None of them are above the efficacy boundary. So these three treatments and control continue to the next stage, which involves recruiting more patients and looking at all of the patients you've assessed so far and calculating test statistics. This time, the purple treatment here is, uh, is lower than the futility boundary. That's even though it's, it's still performing a bit better than control because the test statistics are above zero. But still, it's saying that the chances of concluding significance for this treatment, if we continued it, are low. So we should drop it. The black treatment here is between the two, so that would continue. But in this case, the orange treatment's above the efficacy boundary. So we can say that that's significantly better than control and in this case, we'd stop the trial and conclude orange is better. But you could continue with the black treatment if you like. You notice that um, at the end, we have uh, the two boundaries meeting. So you will make a decision one way or the other at the end of the trial. OK, so um, there's quite a lot of parameters to choose from here. So we've got these. In this case, for only three stages, we've got three efficacy boundaries. We've got two extra futility boundaries, because the last one's the same as the efficacy boundary. And we've got uh, the number of patients that we recruit per arm per stage. So that's a large number of parameters to choose from. So these, how do we actually choose these values? Well, we do it in a similar manner to a normal trial. We choose them so that some type 1 error constraint and some power constraint is met. Uh, but these are slightly more complicated than in a randomized controlled trial. So for a type 1 error rate, we might be, if we're going to adjust for um, testing, we might look at the family-wise error rate. If not, we might look at the per arm type 1 error rate. That depends on whether we're adjusting or not. For power, there's even more possibilities. One quite common one that's used is called the least favorable configuration, by, uh, which was recommended by Dunnett quite a while ago. And this is basically looking at the probability of recommending, say, experimental treatment 1 when it is effective, so it has some clinically relevant effect. And the other treatments are ineffective, so they have some uninteresting treatment um, effect, which may be zero or it may be slightly higher than zero. So that's just looking at the power to recommend treatment one in that case. And uh, yeah, so that's quite often used. But there's a large number of possibilities that you could use for the power. If you're using this family-wise error rate and power under the least favorable configuration, then there's some nice analytical results in a paper by Magir et al. And I'm not going to, you don't have to understand this, but it's just saying that uh, I'm just pointing out that it involves a multi-dimensional integral. So J is the number of stages here, and it's a function um, that is to do with the number of experimental arms. So basically, this is difficult to evaluate, and it's going to probably need numerical techniques to do. Um, so it takes quite a while to evaluate, especially for more than two stages. So it's not ideal. You could use simulation instead. The, the main thing to, um, to get from the paper, in my opinion, is the fact that you strongly control the family-wise error rate when you uh, control the family-wise error rate when all of the treatments are the same as control in their effect. So that's saying that that's the global null hypothesis that we looked at earlier when all of the treatments have the same effect as control. That will be the maximum family-wise error rate, the maximum chance of making a type 1 error. So all we have to do is control the family-wise error rate at that point. What do we gain from these extra interim analyses? Well, we gain the efficiency I talked about earlier. So this, this is represented by something called the expected sample size. And the expected sample size is just the sample size you'd need if you did this design over and over again on independent sets of patients. On average, group sequential MAMS designs should be more efficient than just a multi-arm trial without an interim analysis. That's saying that the expected sample size will be lower than the sample size needed by the multi-arm trial without interims. Can I ask a, pre a previous slide? Yeah. Sorry, can I give you the... So, so uh, on, and on this slide, you're, you're trying to get those those boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so I uh, didn't have, didn't go into it in much detail, but these depend and, on the, the and, boundaries. Yeah. And so, you, you want you want that the test statistic, whichever it is, to uh, uh, the 
the probability of crossing that uh, efficacy boundary yeah. to be alpha. Exactly, if you sum up the uh, probabilities at each stage. Yeah. And so what, what is the test statistic you're uh, using? Is the, is the maximum? Um, the so, ma so this is a multivariate test statistic. It's looking at all of the test statistics for all the treatments. So they have, if you have three treatments, you have three test statistics. Yeah, three experiments. And at each look, you'll have three, three Z statistics. If they continue at each stage, yeah. So, so you look at the distribution of test statistics. If all of the treatments continued at every stage, right. then from that you. But to get the boundary, you want to see that the, that the biggest, that the biggest one. It's a bit more complicated just because of the futility stopping. But uh, you can have the one of the treatments stopping early for futility, which means it can't be rejected later on. But right. generally, yes, that's the, that's the idea. Yeah looking at the maximum, basically. Actually, I was going to say that you, you were doing some work in Cytel on making this more and a more efficient formula, weren't you? It's just uh, the equation looks so complicated. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> so I, when I, I, I visited Cytel a couple of years ago, and they were talking about they came up with an idea to, to improve the okay. efficiency of this. But uh, has that? Uh, <laughs> OK, well, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> OK. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so the expected sample size should be lower than the sample size you need for a multi-arm trial. But if you continue all of the treatments to the end of the trial and don't stop any, that's called that sample size you need for that's called the maximum sample size. And that will be larger than um, what you need for the multi-arm trial without interim analyses and quite considerably larger. So that's saying under the kind of worst case scenario where all of the treatments continue to the end, you'll need a lot more patients than you would have if you didn't have interim analyses. But the chances of that happening are very low. Hopefully. OK. So um, the choice of these stopping boundaries makes a big difference to the expected sample size and maximum sample size. So like group sequential designs, you can look at fixed shape designs such as O'Brien, Fleming, or um, Pocock designs. And these were investigated in the paper I mentioned earlier. Alternatively, you can look for what's called an optimal design. And an optimal design is the design that has the lowest expected sample size given the power and type 1 error constraint for some value of the treatment effects. So there's actually a, a, you know, an infinite number of optimal designs as well. You need to choose one in advance. This is quite a, a challenging computational problem. You can get more details on that in, in this paper here. That's in statistics and medicine. Just to give you a flavor of what the different optimal designs look like in terms of the expected sample size. So this is a plot from that paper. In this case, we change the treatment effects of all treatments at once. This is for a, uh, two stages and four experimental arms. So all of the treatment effects are varying on the x-axis here. The expected sample size is on the y-axis. And the blue line here represents one called the no optimal design. You see that's lowest when all of the treatment effects are zero. That's the, the best possible design you can have at that point. But it doesn't do very well when the treatment effects are, are higher so that um, there are effective treatments. Uh, this, this red line here represents what's called the LFC optimal design, which is optimal when one of the treatments is effective and all of the others aren't. So you can see that that does quite well when the treatment effects are around here. And the black line represents one that I've developed uh, from in group sequential designs without multiple arms called the delta minimax design. And that just has the lowest maximum expected sample size. So it should have the lowest peak uh, here, although it's very close for red one in this case. You can see it does better here and perhaps worse here than the red uh, design. But it can perform pretty well normally. OK, I'm just going to have a few, few more slides on group sequential MAMS designs. So I've talked about normally distributed outcomes, but you can easily get these to work for binary outcomes. So that's in Brass and et al. or time to event outcomes in Royston et al. One thing that's really important is whether you've got a long delay between recruiting patients and assessing their treatment effect. So imagine your patient, when they come along, you don't see whether they're a success until 10 years' time. Well, hopefully in 10 years' time, you'll have recruited all of the other patients, so it'd be too late to make any uh, adaptions and dropping treatments, things like that. Whereas if, if you see it very quickly after recruitment, you have a lot more information at your interim analyses to, to make changes. So we really want either a short delay or a uh, slow recruitment rate. So that's perhaps opposite to what's often wanted in clinical trials. You, um, you, a slower recruitment rate tends to mean that you've got more information at the interim analysis. 
Uh, if you have a long delay endpoint, but you've also got one that's informative for it, so maybe a correlated intermediate outpoint, outpoint, so outcome, then you can use that as well. And uh, there's a, a trial called the MRC Stampede trial, which did this. So they used progression-free survival as an intermediate outcome that was more quickly observed, and uh, overall survival as the definitive outcome. So they made treatment decisions, which treatments to drop on the progression-free survival outcome, and the final decisions were made on overall survival. That's a bit more complicated because you need to assume correlation between the endpoint and things like that. So you might need to have good information about that. Uh, allocation to the control group. So you can gain efficiency by allocating more patients to the control group than you do to one of the experimental treatments. Perhaps you could simplistically think of this as being because the control group in this case is used in every comparison. So you want to improve the precision of the estimated control effect. In fact, uh, the MRC Stampede trial used uh, two to one in favor of control. Um, and Dunnett showed that in multi-arm trials without interim analysis, this is optimal. So the optimal allocation is about the square root of the number of experimental treatments. But in fact, in MAM trials, because you have the chance of stopping treatments early, the optimal allocation to control is lower than this, although it's still higher than one to one. This is a, a table from a paper of mine where we looked at the different numbers of uh, experimental treatments, so that's what K is, and the different numbers of stages. We looked at the optimal allocation, which would give the lowest um, expected sample size for some fixed power. So you can see, even for very high numbers of treatments, uh, eight here, the optimal allocation ratio isn't anywhere near two to one even, Never, uh, you know, not, not to mention square root of eight. So generally, closer to a one-to-one -one allocation will be optimal for MAMD trials. And in fact, do we want to put more patients on control anyway? Well, that kind of goes against one of the reasons we, we, patients like perhaps being on a, a trial where they're more likely to get an experimental treatment. So do we want to have a higher control allocation? Maybe we do if the control treatment's a lot cheaper than the others or something like that. But I'd say for statistical reasons, probably don't deviate from a one-to-one -one allocation. Uh, it's not gonna buy you that much extra efficiency. It's not, it's, I mean, even, even though it's 1.24 for the, even though it's 1.24 for the control, there's still a, a 1. Point, say 1.35. There's still they still have three other treatments. That is yeah, yeah, they're more they are more likely to get an experimental they're treatment. More likely yeah. to get the treatment yeah. anyway, right? That's true. But if you look at, I mean, if you look at the, I should have shown what the expected sample size is here. It's very close to a one-to-one -one allocation, so you don't gain much statistically. Yeah. So what I'm saying is if there's a good reason to do it other than statistically, then feel free to do it. But statistical reasons alone, I don't think, justify deviating from a one-to-one. -one. And is that under a, that uh, least favorable configuration? Yeah, uh, it's under, we looked at different, um, different situations and it was, it's pretty similar in all of them, yeah. Thank you, yeah, that's a good, good question. Any, any other questions? I think I've reached the end of the group sequential part of the talk. So if there's any questions on group sequential, multi-R, multi-stage trials, happy to take them now. Oh, thanks, James. What is the penalty on inference? Because at the end of the day, you yeah, need to... Bias and, yeah, yeah. Good question, yeah. So if you do any kind of adaptive design and you use the maximum likelihood estimator at the end of the trial to get your, um, expect, your, your treatment effects, then that's generally biased because of the adaptive procedure used. In, in this case, uh, it depends whether you're allowing early stopping for efficacy or not. If you're allowing early stopping for eff efficacy, the bias can be quite high if you just use the maximum likelihood estimator. There are improved estimators that you could use instead, which reduce the bias. I don't know if anyone's developed an unbiased estimator for a general multi-R, multi-stage trial. If you're just allowing futility stopping, then generally the bias is a bit lower. That's um, yeah, so that's, it's mostly when you're allowing early stopping for efficacy that you get the most bias. Okay, I'll uh, move on to the next type of design. This is called uh, Drop the Losers. And this is kind of motivated by the fact that in the group sequential MAMS trial, I, I've only mentioned the expected sample size so far, but of course the sample size you need is random and it's highly variable. So in this case, this is a box plot showing the sample size you need for a, a MAMS trial for the case I showed earlier. 
you can see the expected samples, this is actually the median sample size, is below 300, but it can go to uh, over 500 if you get unlucky. Um, that's not ideal um, because you, I mean, if you're an academic, certainly you have to apply for a grant and say how much money you're asking for the trial. I, I suspect it's the same in industry. Um, you, you need to specify how much money you need to do the trial. And if you just say, they say, how much money do you need? And they say, well, well probably a, a, a million, but it could be three million. Uh, that's not going to be ideal. So, uh, you know, you don't want to have a, a variable possible sample size. So this leads to considering uh, alternative designs which have the, the op kind of improved uh, efficiency but don't have a variable sample size. So this is basically just what I'm saying uh, earlier. So you've got the, the funding um, here and you've also got other things like logistics. So generally on trials you recruit uh, people to help you run your clinical trial and having a kind of uh, expected uh, contract length won't be ideal and if someone's going to lose their job if a trial stops early then they might be uh, motivated to do something wrong to make sure the trial continues. So yeah, a MAMS design that has a fixed sample size might be quite useful in this case because of these reasons. So one has been well studied in the past is a two-stage drop the losers design. And this just starts with a, a number of experimental treatments and a control treatment, has a single interim analysis, and at the interim analysis, you just choose the best performing experimental treatment and the control treatment and take that forward to the next part of the trial. And that's often used in the phase two, phase three seamless type of trial where you're choosing from <laughs> several treatments and testing one of them in a phase three trial. So this has got a fixed sample size, which is good, but it's got the disadvantage that it's only got the one interim analysis as it's uh, proposed. So we wanted to explore whether adding more interim analyses would be uh, more efficient. So we wanted to extend to more than two stages and see whether it provided uh, extra efficiency to justify extra logistical issues. So what, one important thing to consider when you're choosing a number of interim analyses is each one takes quite a lot of work to do. So you should only add an extra interim analysis if it provides a lot of benefit. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, we also wanted to see what price we paid for this kind of fixed sample size. So how did the sample size needed for this drop the loser design compared to the expected sample size of a group sequential MAMS design? So I'm gonna assume J stages and K experimental treatments again. And for a drop the loser design, we specify the number of treatments that will be in the trial at each stage. So if we have three stages and four treatments, then if we have a 4-2-1 design, that means we start with four, we choose the best two at the first interim analysis, and we choose the, the best one at the second interim analysis. That drops two treatments after the first and another one after the second. So it would look like this. This is the same data as before. This time, uh, you can't quite see it, but the light blue treatment, well, that's definitely worse. But also the purple treatment is, um, you know, these two treatments are the worst, so they would get dropped in this case, and just the top two would be taken forward. This time, the orange treatment's looking best, so we drop the black treatment, and we get more patients in this case, and compared to a critical value, that determines whether we re should reject the null hypothesis or not. So in this case, we would reject the null hypothesis, but if this was below the line, we wouldn't. Will the, these boundaries be different then? Well, uh, we, we don't have any, well, we have this boundary, which is just a, this sh should be more accurately just at this stage. There's no efficacy starting? Uh, no, but you, you can, but uh, we didn't want that because we wanted to fix sample size. So we, we, oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. chose to just look at the case where you have a fixed number of treatments at each stage. I'll drop exactly. exactly. But you can have early stopping as well. That makes a kind of hybrid design. Um, that's been looked at by uh, Nigel Stallard, so a, few, a couple of papers by him are very useful on that, yes. But in this case, we're just assuming a fixed number of treatments at each stage. You're comparing this sample size with the expected sample exactly. size of the... Of the group sequential, yeah. Yeah. So I'll show you how it does later on. Um, uh, so in this case, we only have two different uh, parameters to choose from. We've got the number of patients to recruit at each stage for each arm that's remaining, and we've got the final test statistic boundary. But actually, we do have more parameters. We have the choice of how many treatments should be dropped at each stage. So that is another parameter to choose from, but generally it's much less. 
So in this case, uh, again, again, assume we're controlling the family-wise error rate and the power at the least favorable configuration. That's just so we have a fair comparison with the group sequential design. And uh, in this case, uh, we've managed to prove that the family-wise error rate at the global, sorry, no, we've, we've shown that if you control the family-wise error rate at the global null, it strongly controls the family-wise error rate again. So we only need to consider the family-wise error rate at the global null when all of the treatments have the same effect as the control treatment. So in that case, we just look at when all treatment effects are zero and choose C so that we've got a fixed family-wise error rate. Then we choose the number of patients we need to satisfy the power constraint. <clears throat> so we've got analytical formally for these operating characteristics. And one nice thing is uh, they're much more efficiently evaluated because it's a multi-dimensional integral over a multivariate normal distribution. And this is extremely quick to evaluate using a uh, method of Gentz and Brett's, and that's implemented in R. So it's, uh, you can have quite large numbers of stages and large numbers of arms, and it's still very quick to evaluate. So uh, in, in that sense, it's better than the group sequential approach. Then we can quickly search for the optimal drop the loser design, and that's the one where we search over each possibility for how many treatments are dropped in order to minimize the required sample size for a, for a certain power. Okay, so here are some results. Um, we first compared three-stage drop the loser designs to two-stage drop the loser designs to see whether we gained anything from this extra interim analysis. We, we used the Taylor trial um, setup again, which is discussed in McGeer et al. Um, and, okay, so we looked at different numbers of treatments here, so three, four, six, and eight, and we looked at the total sample size you'd need for 90% power at the least favorable configuration. And we also looked at a multi-arm trial without interim analysis, so you can get some idea how much an interim analysis gets you. So for a low number of treatments, you, you get some efficiency gain, but you generally get quite a small gain from going from two to three uh, interim analyses. So perhaps it's not so much recommended there. It's only a 4.2% reduction in sample size. Whereas if you have you know, four, you're getting a 9.3% reduction. That's a bit healthier. And for even, even more treatments, you're, you're gaining even more. So perhaps if you've got more treatments, it's more justifiable to add an extra interim analysis. You can see in all cases, we gain over the one stage case. And again, it's, it's a bigger gain if you have more treatments. Okay, so we've kind of concluded there that if you've got four or more experimental treatments, then you should probably have an additional interim analysis because it gets you quite a lot more efficiency. So we next compared the three-stage drop the loser design to a three-stage group sequential MAMS design, and we looked at four treatments and six treatments. Uh, we made sure that both had the same family-wise error rate and power, so it's a fair comparison. Both have the same number of interim analyses. And we looked at the sample size distribution of the group sequential design um, at the null hypothesis when all of the treatments are equal to zero and the least favorable configuration. Actually, we looked at a few more. Um, so we've got four scenarios here. One is the, the, when all of the treatments are ineffective. One is the least favorable configuration. One's effective, the others are ineffective. And the third one is uh, all of the experimental treatments are slightly effective, but they have quite a low effect. And the fourth one is that all of them are slightly worse than control. So the red dashed line here represents the sample size you need for the drop the loser design. And notice that doesn't depend on the scenario because it's fixed. The box plots represent the sample size you see if you do a large number of these trials. Um, and you can see that it's quite highly variable. In the first scenario, the median sample size from the group sequential approach is you know, quite considerably lower than the red boundary here, uh, the red line here. So in that case, we do pay a fair, fairly high price for this fixed sample size. But under other scenarios, such as scenario two, there's, there's no difference. That implies the drop the loser design might be good if you only expect you know, one treatment to be good. The third scenario is even better. So that's when all of the experimental treatments have a positive but low effect. But it's pretty bad for the case where all of the experimental treatments are worse than control. And that's because the group sequential design will drop those treatments quite early if they're not performing well, whereas the drop the loser design as proposed here will continue to the end even with a very poor treatment. So you might uh, want to introduce some early stopping rules, maybe a futility stopping rule, 
which would stop the trial if all of the treatments are performing poorly. And in that case, it's probably going to narrow the gap here slightly. OK, so that's uh, the last bit on drop the loser design. So any thoughts or uh, questions on, on drop the loser design? Sorry. Thanks. Um, something that slightly bothers me about this drop the loser design, you're, you're dropping your worst one or two treatments. Yeah. What if there's only a tiny, trivial little difference between the worst treatment and the next worst? Yeah. Does that that's not price you seem pay, really. uncomfortable? Yeah, that's a common objection to it. That, uh, OK, let's have a go back to the toy example. Um, OK, so this isn't too bad here, but imagine the purple treatment was like pretty much where the black treatment was. Then it would seem wrong to have to, to drop it. But you do have to drop it if you want to maintain the type 1 error rate. So that's probably a common... That's a common objection, yeah, I think the fact that you've, you've got that. But then again, uh, people say the same thing about the group sequential approach where it's just under the boundary and you've got to stop it and clinicians might not want to stop it. So it is a problem with other ones, but perhaps I agree it's more of a problem here, yeah. So it's a similar a question along the similar sort of lines. So when you're doing, for example, a phase 2B study looking at um, dose response, mm -hmm. um, Clearly, you'd expect your highest dose to be the most effective. So if you're using a drop the loser, you would expect to keep the highest dose all the way through. Yeah. But that doesn't in any way consider the safety profile of it, mm -hmm. at which point you might end up wanting to choose a slightly lower dose, mm -hmm. which has a better safety profile than maybe the most effective. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll say this to that. It's a really good question. You don't have to pick the, the best treatments at each stage. You can pick whichever ones you want to continue. Picking the best ones will be the case where it's got the highest type 1 error rate. So if you, if you want to pick maybe, maybe the black and purple treatments in this case uh, are better than the orange one because it's not safe. So you continue with these two. If you do that, then your type 1 error rate will be lower than you planned, so it's conservative. But that's fine. You can use other criteria to decide which treatments to take forward as long as it's uh, at most two in this case, for example. But yeah, great question. Um, you, Maybe you could build some kind of composite endpoint that considers safety as well. I don't know whether that would be of interest. But um, yeah, I think that's really good. It does illustrate the shortfall of this type of design, that uh, you're basing it on one thing and you're, you're fixed to taking a certain number through. You can't, if this one is almost as good, you can't just sneak in the third one to the next stage. Any, OK? Yeah, I have yeah sorry. <laughs> In, in, so in this case, uh, the boundaries are computed right at the beginning, and you don't yep. you don't change them at all. Uh, uh, As in the boundaries being the number of treatments you would take, uh, the, the, or the final boundary, the, the stopping boundary for efficacy. Yeah, that's fixed. That's fixed. Fix, yeah. yeah, beforehand. Yeah, and so uh, and it's, it's fixed so that it, it, for the worst case. So even when you when you when you drop the yeah. loser, it's still. Still protects yeah, it's chosen on the basis that you always take forward the, it's the best in terms of the uh, assumption that you you will be carrying all of them to the end, so that uh, if you drop one of them in the middle, yeah, it won't affect the type one error. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So you could design a trial as if you're going to carry on with all of them to the end, choose the boundary based on that, and then do whatever you want as interim analysis. Well, yeah, I, I was thinking of uh, like an adaptive design. In which, uh, if you if you drop, if you dropped an arm uh, in the middle, yeah, uh, you know you could use a uh, like the conditional error approach yep. to re to recompute the boundaries yep. going forward, and uh, and that's maybe good. that would give you more effort. More Absolutely, effort. yeah, that's definitely worth considering. I'm not really that familiar with conditional errors. I'm more familiar with kind of p-value combination. In which case you'd have to specify in advance how you're weighting the contributions from the different stages, wouldn't you? The conditional error approach would say that you, uh, uh, if, if you're going to make a change in the, in the middle of the trial, yep. you, uh, you, you calculate the conditional type 1 error mm -hmm. of, the of the original design, yep. and then you, you equate so then you get the new boundaries of the, of the, new, of the new design. So as long as your new design has the same, same right. type, an error. Okay. I was just thinking that you you could be more dynamic and change yep. 
change the boundaries as as you go forward. Yeah. Maybe that's too complicated. No, I think that's really worth considering. Yeah, I think this design as proposed has a number of limitations and there are some things you can do quite simply, but maybe more advanced techniques like that are needed to really make it as, as good as it can be. Um, yeah, um, so I'll move on to, <clears throat> pardon me, starting to lose my voice. I'll move on to adaptive randomization. This is a third approach I'm gonna consider. This is a procedure that increases the allocation for treatments that have been successful and decreases it for treatments that have been unsuccessful. And it's been a long <coughs> literature on this going back um, to, I don't know, the 1940s. Sophia knows, yeah, something like that. Um, on the case of a single experimental treatment and a single control treatment. But in that case, uh, if you're using adaptive randomization, you'll tend to put more patients on the better performing treatment and you deviate from a one-to-one -one allocation, which is generally the most powerful. So although you might uh, be better for the patients in terms of the average patient response will be better, you lose power. So it's been quite controversial for that reason, the loss in power. But if you have a multi-arm trial with a, a shared control group, uh, you can apply the adaptive randomization procedure just to the experimental treatments. And this idea was uh, uh, first, at least from what I know, first described in uh, Tripper et al. in 2012. So you just apply the adaptive randomization procedure to the experimental treatments and set the allocation for controls independently. So you can always have a certain number of controls, uh, which means your power is maintained. And in fact, it's, it's, it's even better. So, um, this could be thought of as a more flexible version of the kind of group sequential MAMS approach where you either are you know, recruiting a certain number or recruiting zero. In this case, you could change the allocation between those two extreme scenarios. Um, but does it perform well? Well, here's a, just enough, a, I think this is the same data as before, just, just to illustrate. So we start off with these um, test statistics uh, at the first stage, we might randomize patients equally between all treatments. And after seeing this data, the orange treatment's performing best and the light blue treatment's performing worse. So we, we set the allocation um, to be lower for the light blue treatment and higher for the orange treatment. In this case, we increase the control allocation to match the allocation to the best treatment. That's in order to kind of maximize the power recruit more patients. So in this case, we are recruiting more blue patients. I'm not sure if you can, can't even see it myself. Uh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> it's right at the bottom, is it? Okay, yeah, I think I put that there just to show what happens if, if it's really bad, then you start going towards zero. And if you go below a certain threshold, you probably just set it to zero. In this case, you've got even more evidence that orange is best. So you increase the allocation more and increase the control allocation and set the others. So this is all done using some formula. It's not kind of made up on the fly. And finally, you've got the final test statistics and you compare to, um, to some, uh, I'm not sure where it is here actually, I haven't put it in, but there's some critical value that determines whether you reject the null hypothesis for that treatment or not. Okay, so if you want a more formal description of this design, you can check out this paper by myself and uh, Lorenzo Tripper, 2014. And we, we set out to compare group sequential MAMS designs, which I'd mostly worked on, and adaptive randomization, which he had mostly worked on, and compare them in a variety of scenarios for binary endpoints. So we found, uh, I'm just gonna give you a brief summary of the results. We found that if all the treatments were ineffective, then this MAMS design was uh, tended to have a lower expected sample size than, again, the fixed sample size used by adaptive randomization. Adding a futility rule helped narrow the gap, but it's still, uh, there's still a gap. In the case where there was a single effective treatment or maybe multiple effective treatments, then adaptive randomization really did very well. It required a lower sample size for the same power. And it also led to a slightly better average treatment response. So I'm just gonna show you uh, sample sizes needed uh, it's a different example in this case, so it's 80% power, 20% family-wise error rate, and it's binary endpoints, so we're looking for a difference of 0.2 in the success probability, I think from 0.2 to 0.4. Uh, the blue box plots here represent the null scenario where all of the treatments are ineffective, and the pink box plots represent the case where one of the experimental treatments is effective. 
and the red dashed line represents the sample size needed by adaptive randomization. And we're changing the number of uh, interim analyses here. So we start off with three and we go up to 10. So, um, so basically what I've said on the previous slide is the case. So under the null hypothesis, when all of the treatments are ineffective, then the MAMS design tends to have a lower expected and median sample size, although it's pretty similar for three um, stages. On the other hand, uh, it's much better under the alternative, the least favorable configuration. One thing to notice is if you increase the number of uh, interim analyses, then generally things improve in terms of the sample size needed by both um, approaches, but you get most of the gain by the time you get to three experimental treatments. You can see going to five gives you a bit more you don't get much from going to 10. So we kind of recommend between three and five interim analyses as a maximum for this type of multi-arm design. Uh, we use as a case study this uh, NeoSphere trial, which was a multi-arm trial, uh, three experimental arms and a control arm. And they it was a phase two trial. They recruited 400 patients equally allocated between the four arms. And in this case, the uh, endpoint was pathological complete response, which is a binary endpoint. But they didn't consider any interim analyses, so we wanted to see how interim analyses would um, do here. OK, but before I talk about the results, um, this gave us a good opportunity to consider how much efficiency we lose from um, delay from recruiting patients and assessing them. Uh, so as I said before, adaptive designs will tend to be less efficient if a delay is long or the recruitment rate is high. Because if either of those is true, at a certain interim analysis, unless you're pausing recruitment, which we don't recommend, um, there will be a lot of patients who have been recruited but not yet assessed. And you, you can't change anything for them. So they're, they're not contributing to your interim analysis, but there's nothing you can do to change their treatment allocation. So in this case, the Neosphere trial had an average recruitment rate of four patients per week and a delay of 15 weeks. So this is gave gave us a good opportunity to explore the effect of delay. We kept the delay the same, but, in, but changed the recruitment rate between two and eight. So we considered a higher recruitment rate and a lower recruitment rate. And we set both the maximum, so the maximum sample size of the adaptive randomization procedure to 400. That makes sense. We didn't know whether to set the expected sample size of the MAMS designed to 400 or the maximum sample size. We did it both ways, but I'm going to present the case where we set the expected sample size to 400 so that more patients than 400 could be used, but on average, it'll be 400. OK, so this is quite a, a lot of stuff to talk through. So I've got a bit of a slide where uh, so I've looked at the power of a multi-arm design without interim analyses. Oh, sorry, I should say that we uh, assumed the the values for the pathological complete response that have been found in the actual trial. So in that trial, there have been one effective treatment. It had been quite a lot better than control. One quite close to control, but still slightly better. And one worse than control. Um, so in that case, the, the power of a multi-arm design without interim analyses was about 0.7. And you can see in this case, the power of, of these is, is, is higher than 0.7 and quite a bit higher if you have more interim analyses. So that's good. Uh, the delay has got quite an effect on the efficiency. So we, as we change the recruitment rate, so zero just means not considering delay effectively from two to eight. Um, so you can see as the recruitment goes up, the power of the adaptive randomization goes down. Uh, the, it doesn't change for the MAMS design, but the expected sample size in that case goes quite considerably up. So it affects the two in different ways affects the power of the adaptive randomization design and it affects the ex expected sample size of the MAMS design. Okay, um, one thing I'd point out is that one, th one nice thing about adaptive randomization is that it doesn't require so much adjustment for when you, as you assume a different number of patients will be available at the interim uh, compared to what was available. Um, so if your recruitment rate is wrong, then the adaptive randomization procedure deals with that quite well, whereas you need to make quite, a, quite big adjustments to the stopping boundaries for the MAMS design on that basis. So that's one thing I liked about the adaptive randomization procedure. Or you could do interim analyses after a given number of patients have been assessed um, rather than recruited. So we did look at that in the paper as well. OK, so I've got a few discussion points. How am I doing for time? Uh, just, uh, just over an hour. So I've got half an hour left. 
Um, so a few discussion points on MAMS designs. Uh, I've focused on statistical uh, issues here, but there are a lot of logistic and practical implications of these different designs, and perhaps the different designs that we consider have different um, logistical issues. Uh, bias, as you, as you said earlier, so if we use um, these designs and we did a maximum likelihood estimator at the end, we, we tend to get bias. But we also might have selection bias. So maybe as we go through the trial, the treatments are changing. So some ineffective treatments may be dropped. Maybe that will influence which patients a clinician will put on a trial. Um, so they might put their worst performing uh, you know, the lower performing patients on the trial rather than the better performing ones or something like that. So this idea of patient drift is quite important. It's not such an issue for the group sequential approach because you always have the equal numbers of patients randomised at each stage, but it might be more of an issue for adaptive randomization. Uh, how many interim analyses should we do? We've, we've tended to find that you know, about three, four or five is, is optimal in terms of what we gain, um, but maybe there's other considerations for how many we should choose. And another discussion issue which is important at the moment is uh, ongoing trials that keep adding in new treatments as ones are dropped. And um, I will discuss one of these later. Uh, just to, I've just got a few more slides on biomarker trials, but I thought I'd pause here to discuss the kind of MAMS designs in general without bias.